Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir Naik. Before I begin the question and answers, a little about myself. In 1996, I accepted Islam at the University of California, Berkeley. And the lecture which facilitated my acceptance of Islam was a fraction of this lecture. Had I heard this, I probably would have been overblown and uh, mashallah, you, some people are just given that gift and uh, you have been given that gift. I shouldn't praise people in their presence, but. Now, back to the question and answers. In order to make this run as smoothly and quickly as possible, I would ask everyone in attendance tonight to please keep your questions strictly to the topic, to ask your question briefly, to be orderly at the mics and queue in a line and do not bunch. And I would also like to remind everyone here in the audience that we are brothers and sisters in humanity. And for those non-Muslims who are with us tonight, you are our brothers and you are our sisters and we will give you a priority at the mics. So if you have a question, we ask that the volunteers facilitate those people in getting to the microphones and they have the priority. Brothers and sisters, if you came with a non-Muslim guest and they are slightly shy, please do motivate them to ask their question because we have people who can give the best answers, inshallah. And uh, for those Muslims here, you have many opportunities, so please do let the non-Muslims ask their questions. Uh, we have three microphones, one in the rear for the brothers, in the front for the brothers, and one in the sister section here. So if you have a question, try to make your way to these one, two, three microphones. Written questions will receive second priority. Those questions at the microphone will be answered first. I know that we have one very patient brother who is a non-Muslim, and he waited this entire talk to ask his question. So at this time, I will go to the front mic in the males section and ask the brother to please state your name, your occupation, and then briefly state your question. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Aditya, and I'm doing my final year engineering in Chennai. Um, though I'm a Hindu, I have been having this uh, question about Islam that I wanted to ask and no better a person than Dr. Zakir Naik. Uh, as you said in your speak many times, the Holy Quran was written 1400 years ago and is considered the most worthy and the latest revelation given by Allah. So I have two questions to you. Allah, who knows all, why didn't he give his best of revelation the first time itself to the first of messengers? And why did God take so many times to give his best of knowledge? And my second question which is related to this is, even before the Holy Quran was written, that is 1400 years ago, human beings had lived in the earth for thousands of years. So why did Allah the most merciful didn't give them that best knowledge which he has given us for the last 1400 years? Thank you. The brother asked a very good question, very relevant question. Two questions, both the questions overlapping the answers. He said that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give this last and final revelation 1400 years ago? Why not in day one when you meet were there? And second part, which is a part of the same question, that what about the people who lived before 14 years ago? They were deprived of the Quran. So if Allah is most merciful, most gracious, most beneficent, so isn't it that the people earlier before 14 years were deprived? Very good question. To reply a question, my son, he tells me that, Abba, father, you want me to become a doctor? Why do you put me in nursery, first standard, second standard, then school, then college? Why don't you put me into medical college directly? If I want my son to become a medical doctor, I don't have to put him into the medical college directly. I have to first make the grounds very clear. First he goes into the pre-primary school, then goes into the school, first standard onwards on past his school, then goes to the higher school, then college, and when he's fit, then he enters the medical college. Similarly, 
almighty God, who has knowledge of the unseen, has knowledge of everything, he even has knowledge of the human beings. So, it is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 38, Allah says, لِكُلِّ أَجْلٍ kitab that we have sent a revelation in every age, in every period. By name, four are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. But there were several revelations sent. The first revelation, Almighty God knew that the human beings had to develop. If he would have revealed the Quran at the first time, at the time of Adam, peace be upon him, he knew the human beings won't be able to grasp it. That is the reason in the revelation that came before the Quran, that is the Injil. Today we have the Bible, though we don't consider the Bible to be the Injil, but some parts of the Bible may be the Word of God. It's mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the Spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall show you the way to come. He shall glorify me. So here, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he knew, but yet he said that you will not be able to grasp it. Therefore, when the last and final messenger will come, he will show you things to come. So similarly, Almighty God, he knew very well that when is the right time for the human beings to receive the last and final revelation in the Quran, and that was about 1400 years ago. As far as the second part of the question is concerned, what about the people that came before the Quran was revealed? I will tell them that if my son goes to standard one, he will not be given the medical question paper. He'll be given the question paper of standard one. If he goes to higher school, he'll be given the question of higher school. Then junior college, fine? So similarly, the basic message of Almighty God in all the scriptures, in all the revelations, from the first revelation till the last revelation, Quran was the same, that you have to believe in one God, that you have to worship him and no one else. So all the messengers, right from the first messenger, Adam, peace be upon him, right down to Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, all of them taught the basic message of oneness of God and about Tawheed. And about this message of oneness of God and Tawheed, inshallah, I'll be discussing in detail on the last day of this conference, on the last Sunday, that's the 20th of January, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you for the question. Do we have another question from a guest here, non-Muslim? Okay, we'll go to the gentleman section, rear microphone. Gentlemen, could you please state your name and your occupation, please? Good evening, everyone. My name is Sanjeev. Um, I'm working here in Land Marvel Company as an admin executive. Uh, I got a few questions, but I'll ask only two questions uh, regarding this uh, Islam First question is, uh, do Islam believe in rebirth? Uh, and second question is, in Islam, it's not allowed to commit suicide. But many people that in Pakistan, in Arabic countries, they are uh, blowing themselves up and they are killing many people. So who, they, who are the people they are motivating them? Whether they are for, really following the Islam or who is motivating them? That is my question, sir. The brother has two questions. The first question, does Islam believe in rebirth? And the second question, that is suicide prohibited in Islam? How come people in Pakistan, other part of the world, they're blowing up themselves and killing themselves? The two questions. As far as the first question is concerned, that does Islam believe in rebirth? If you ask only in rebirth, yes. Islam believes in rebirth. What we believe? that a human beings come to this world once, the Quran says that we give you life and you come on this earth. Then we cause you to die and then we resurrect you again in the next life. This is exactly what is mentioned in the Vedas. If you read Rig Ved, book number 10, it speaks about Punar Janam. Punar means next, Janam means life. So the Ved speaks about Punar Janam, about the next life. But Unfortunately, most of the Hindus, they misunderstand the meaning of Punar Janam. Punar means next, Janam means life, we believe in the next life. You say Punar Janam, you say rebirth, we have no problem. But most of the Hindus, they believe in a philosophy known as samsara. It's a Sanskrit word, samsara, which means birth, death, birth, death. 
a cycle of reincarnation, a cycle of birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. This cycle of birth, death, birth, death, or samsara, or reincarnation is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. What they quote is a verse of Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 22, which says that like a human being takes off the old clothes and puts on new clothes, same way the soul throws away the old body and puts on the new body. As far as this is concerned, I've got no objection with the Bhagavad Gita. It's further mentioned even in the Upanishads that like a caterpillar walks up a grass of blade, it jumps onto the new grass, I've got no problem. Now, as far as the scriptures are concerned, if you take the literal meaning of the Ved, which does not speak about the cycle of birth, death, birth, death, but only speaks about punarjanam, next life, Islam speaks the same. But most of the scholars of Hinduism, they could not understand that how can a human being be born with some congenital defect? How can he be born as a handicap? Some are born healthy, some are born handicapped, some are born in rich family, some are born in poor family. So they thought this was injustice. So how could God be unjust? Therefore they propounded the theory of samsara, which is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. The Vedas are considered as the highest Hindu scriptures. In the Hindu scriptures, we have the Smriti and you have the Shruti. Smriti means scriptures written by the human beings and Shruti are the Vedas and Upanishads considered to be the word of God. Now, because they could not justify why some people are born in rich family, some in poor family, some are born healthy, some with congenital defect, they propounded this theory of samsara. As far as Islam is concerned, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah zi khalakal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life you are leading is a test for the hereafter. And we believe that every child is born sinless, is born masoom. Irrespective of whether he's born handicapped or healthy, whether rich family, poor family, all these things are a test for the human beings. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, and Surah Anfal, chapter number eight, verse number 28, he says that surely we will test you with fear and hunger, with loss of life, and loss of what you have earned. It's mentioned in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, that your children and your wives are a test for you. Now here we realize that the Quran says your children are a test for you. Now if a child, suppose, is born handicapped, it's a test for the parents. The parents may be very good, they may be pious, maybe Allah wants to test them more. After giving them a child which is handicapped, yet do they have faith in Allah or not? It's a test. So whenever any calamity befalls any human being, it's either a punishment or a test. Whenever any good thing happens in your life, it's either a reward or it's a test. That does not mean if something bad happens, it has to be a punishment. It can be a punishment, it can be a test. If something good happens in your life, it can be a reward or it can be a test. So here, Almighty God is testing the parents that do they have faith in Almighty God? So if a handicapped child is born, the parent may be an average Muslim, and if he says, oh, why? My child only has to be born handicapped. Why my child has to be born with a congenital heart disease? Allah is testing them. The people who are good Muslims, they'll say, Allah has destined, no problem yet. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And more difficult the test, more higher is the reward. To pass a simple graduation of BA is easy. But to pass MBBS is difficult. The moment you pass MBBS in front of a name, you get doctor, DR full stop. Higher status. Examination is difficult, the honor is more. So Almighty God tests different people different way. The child that is born, what the Hindus said, the Hindu scholars, in his previous janam, in his previous birth, he did a sin, therefore he was born handicapped. They didn't have any other justification. If you do good deeds, then you are born healthy. So what the Hindu scholars, they propounded, that every living creature, it keeps on changing. According to them, 
the universal brotherhood in Hinduism is all living creatures are your brothers. So sometimes you are born as an animal, sometimes as a bird, sometimes as a rat, sometimes as a cockroach, sometimes as a human being. And the human being is the highest level. And you are born as a human being seven times. So they came with this philosophy because they could not justify why a child is born rich or poor, handicapped or healthy. Similarly, for a person who is born poor, it's a test for him. For the rich people, he has to give zakat. Every rich person who has a saving of more than a nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. For the poor person, for him, he gets full marks in zakat. He's poor, so he has to give no zakat, 100 out of 100. But we say, Are garib admi, poor man. Poor man. Poor man, he's got 100 out of 100 in zakat. The rich man, if he gives proper zakat, he may get 100 out of 100. He says, okay, fine, I have got so much wealth. This part is exempted from zakat. He may give 50% of zakat. So he'll get negative points. He may not give zakat at all. So imagine, suppose there's a questioner. There's a question in a question paper, which is very easy. Should you be happy or sad? So when a person is born poor, Actually, in zakat, he gets 100 out of 100. Therefore, beloved prophet said, it's easier for a poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man. But we say, a garib admi, a poor man. How sad. Not sad. 100 out of 100 in zakat. For the rich man, he has to give charity, he has to give zakat, he has to give donation, he'll be accountable for his wealth. So what in Islam, we are born in this world once, and once is sufficient. Once we die, we are resurrected on the day of judgment. You want to call it rebirth, I've got no problem. You want to call it punarjanam, I've got no problem. We say life after death. But surely, if I agree with you for sake of argument, for sake of argument, what the Hindu scholars propound, that you know, sometime you're born as animal, sometime bird, sometime human being. I want to ask you the question, brother. In this world, as every year is passing on, is the population of the human beings increasing or decreasing, brother? Increasing or decreasing? Increasing. increasing. Very good. Is the sin in the world increasing or decreasing? I can't hear you. Increasing or decreasing? Increasing, sir. Sorry? Sorry? Increasing. Increasing. Human beings are increasing and every sin is increasing. If I agree with the philosophy of Hindu scholars, more the sin increases, the population of human beings should decrease. So therefore, I believe in going to the higher scriptures, Vedas. When I talk, which I had given the talk earlier in Chennai, during the first peace conference, that was in 2004, similarities between Islam and Hinduism. And there, I showed and compared that even in Ved, it speaks about one God, no idol worship, and everything. So what is common between the scriptures we follow. So this, the cycle of samsara, birth, death, birth, death, is nowhere to be found in the Vedas. It's the philosophy of the Hindu scholars to justify, because they could not justify why human beings are born poor or healthy, which I've given you the answer in Islam. As far as the second question is concerned, that is suicide haram in Islam, is it prohibited? If yes, then why do people commit suicide? Is somebody instigating them, suicide bombing? The Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 195, that do not make your own hands the cause of your destruction. So according to the Quran, committing suicide is haram, it is prohibited. So as far as committing suicide, it is prohibited. As far as killing any other innocent human being, the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, Unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. So killing any innocent human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, it is prohibited in Islam. So if anyone, whether he puts a bomb without killing himself or with killing himself, if he kills an innocent human being, it is prohibited. So as far as killing innocent human being is concerned, it is prohibited. If you use it as a strategy of war, you know, the Japanese used to do the suicide, you know, 
Initially, where do you get suicide bombing from? According to a professor who wrote a book, Dying to Win in America, he says that the first people who did suicide bombing were the LTT, Tamil Tigers. But yet the blame is put on Muslims. I don't know why. It's the media. Have you ever heard of any Muslim doing suicide bombing? It was first the LTT and then the Americans and maybe some of the Muslims, black sheep may have picked up, but who were the originators? But yet when suicide bombing comes, the terrorists are labeled as Muslims. In Chennai a few years back, I also given a talk on terrorism and jihad, an Islamic perspective. Well, I've described in detail about this answer of suicide bombing as far as Islamic perspective is concerned. But killing innocent human being and committing suicide is haram. Hope that answers the question, brother. Thank you for the question. We'll go to the front mic with the males. If there are any other non-Muslims at the back mic or the sisters' mics, just have the volunteers raise their hands. Any non-Muslim ladies are most welcome to ask the question. And if there are any non-Muslim in the audience, please feel free to come up on the microphone. It's your opportunity. And as previous times I've come to Chennai, Alhamdulillah, all the questions were asked by non-Muslims. So I hope even now the non-Muslims of Chennai, mashallah, are bold enough. You can ask any question, even if it's a criticism. Even if you disagree with whatever I say, no problem, come up and ask the question. Believe me, I'm young, but I can take it. You can criticize the Quran, you can criticize Islam, you can ask, this is the opportunity. Please come up on the microphone and have the doubt cleared. This is the opportunity. And there you've heard it from the man himself. So your name and occupation, please. My name is Ramakrishnan. I'm a software engineer. I have two questions for you. The first is, what does Islam say about donating organs after death? Is it okay or is it prohibited? Second question is, what does Islam say about atheists? That's it. The brother has two questions. I think non-Muslim are one they're asking to, no problem. The first question is, what does Islam say about donating organs? Second question is about atheist. As far as the first question is concerned, what does Islam say about donating organs? There's no direct verse in the Quran or any say hadith which says whether organs can be donated or not. But there are various conferences that have held in Saudi Arabia, in Malaysia, and various different parts of the world. And the scholars have come to a common consensus that if three things are fulfilled, then organs can be donated. Number one, the person who requires an organ, but natural, it should be a major benefit to his health. He can receive organ as long as it's a major benefit or saves his life. Point number two, the person donating the organ, after he donates the organ, it should not be a major loss to his health. For example, if I donate my heart, I will die. So I can't donate my heart. But the doctors say that out of two kidneys present, a person can even survive with one kidney. So if my mother has a kidney failure, both the kidneys have failed, I can very well donate my one kidney to my mother, even she lives, even I live. But naturally, after a person dies, if he wants to donate any other organ, that is permissible. But if he's alive, he should not donate any part of the body which will cause a major damage to his health or a loss of life. And the third criteria is it should not be for money. No one should sell organ. If all these three conditions are fulfilled, then organ donation very well can be done. As far as the second question is concerned, what does Islam have to say about atheist? As far as I'm concerned, whenever I meet an atheist, are you an atheist, brother? He said no. Whenever I meet an atheist, the first thing I do is I congratulate that atheist. People may wonder that why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I'm congratulating an atheist is because most of the human beings, they usually do blind belief. He is a Hindu because father is a Hindu. He is a Christian, father is a Christian. Many Muslims are Muslim because father is a Muslim. Now this atheist, he's thinking. He may be coming from a religious background. His father may be pious, but he does not believe that how can there be a God who requires to eat, a God who can die, a God who can lie. So the reason I congratulate the atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La ilaha, that there is no God. The only thing I have to do is illallah, but Allah. 
which I shall do, inshallah. So half my job is done to a non-Muslim who believes in some other God. First, I have to prove to him that the God he's worshipping is wrong. And after I prove to him that the God he's worshipping is wrong, then I have to prove to him about the correct God. Here, the atheist, half my job is done. He already agrees in the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do, inshallah. The first question asked to the atheist is that what is the definition of God? If anyone says there is no God, to say there is no God, he should know the definition of God. If he does not know the definition of God, he cannot say there is no God. For example, if I say this is a pen, is this a pen? No. It's a book. To say this is not a pen, you should know the definition of pen. Some people say, no, Lakir, I know this is a book, so I can say it's not a pen. I said, no. If you know the definition of pen, I will say, is this a kitab? You say, no, it is not a kitab, because I know the definition of kitab. To say it's not a kitab, you should know the definition of kitab. Because kitab and book is the same. So to say it is not a pen, you have to know the definition of pen. You may or may not know the definition of a book. Correct? So similarly, to say there is no God, you should know the definition of God. So now this person who is atheist, he is believing, oh, that God, he requires to eat, he can lie, he fights and he loses. He does not believe in a God. So I say, even I don't believe in such a God. La ilaha. Then I tell to him the correct concept of God. And the correct concept of God is mentioned for a class, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which I shall discuss in the last day of the conference, inshallah, and that is on 20th of January. So what he's doing? He is rejecting the false God. Then I ask the question to the atheist, that if suppose there is equipment which is bought in front of you, who no one in the world has ever seen, no one knows about it, and if I ask the question that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of their equipment? The atheist will tell. The first person who will tell the mechanism of this equipment, who no one in the world has seen, it is the creator. Some may say the manufacturer. Some may say the inventor. Some will say the person who has made it, maker. He may say creator, maker, inventor, manufacturer. Whatever he says, it will be somewhat similar. Don't grapple with the words. What he says, accept it. Then ask him. Then repeat the lecture which I gave, which I don't intend to be reading, that how did the universe come into existence? So he will tell about the Big Bang. Then I'll tell him that when did you come to know? He will tell you in 1973, yesterday in science, 30 years back, 40 years back. I will say what you are talking about the Big Bang you came to know 30 years back is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned it? He will say maybe it's a fluke. Don't argue with him. Continue. What is the shape of the earth? He will tell you previously people thought it's flat. Now we know it's spherical. When did you come to know? He will tell you 1577 when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the earth. When? 300 years back. 400 years back. 450 years back. The Quran mentions 14 years ago. Who could have mentioned it? He will say, oh, maybe your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was an intelligent man. Don't argue. Continue. Light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? He will tell you, previously we thought light of the moon was its own light. Recently we have come to know a couple of hundred years back, it's reflected light. It's mentioned in the Quran. Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 61. Light of the moon is reflected 14 years back. Who could have mentioned it? Now we'll pause. Don't wait for the answer. Continue. In school, I was taught that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its axis. He'll have either mission the Quran. I said, no, that's what I learned in school. But the Quran says the sun and the moon rotate, which we have come to know recently. In school, 25 years back, I was told the sun did not rotate. The Quran says 14 years back that the sun rotates, which science has discovered today. Who could have mentioned that? There'll be a pause. Don't wait for the reply. Continue. So all the scientific things I mentioned in my talk, after each scientific fact, ask him who could have mentioned it before. And finally, he will tell the creator, the manufacturer, the inventor, the maker, this creator, this manufacturer, this producer, this inventor, we in Islam call as Allah. 
That's the reason today science is not eliminating God, la ilaha, it is eliminating models of God, illallah. Therefore, Sir Francis Bacon, a very famous philosopher, he said that little knowledge of science makes you an atheist, in-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in God. So, with this help of this lecture, Quran, Modern Science, you can prove the existence of God scientifically. Hope that answers the question. Brother, go ahead and state your question. I remind the sisters, inshallah, to motivate those non-Muslim sisters that may be amongst you to ask their questions. This is an excellent opportunity for them. So you should really try to motivate them to come to the microphones. Brother. My name is Ritesh, and I'm a student studying 11th standard. My question is, uh, all the religions have limitations of clothing. Uh, let me be specific to the women. Uh, but they've changed with time. But why is the burqa still the same? Why hasn't that changed with time? And uh, one more question. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, during Ramzan, I've seen all the Muslims will be fasting. The brother said that by the passage of time, every religion has got clothing for women. But by the passage of time, the clothing keeps on changing. But why the Muslim women yet wear the burqa? As far as the clothing is concerned, brother, in Islam, there are six criteria for clothing. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. That is the extent it should be covered. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the rest. There are certain scholars who say that even this should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is, the clothes they wear, it should not be so tight so that it reveals the figure, it should be loose. The third is, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through. The fourth is, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. These are basically the six criteria. And most of the six criteria are even mentioned in the other scriptures. If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 22, verse number 5. It says that the woman shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a man, and a man shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a woman. All those who do this, they are creating an abomination. It's further mentioned in the Bible in the first Timothy, chapter number 2, verse number 9, that the woman should be dressed up with shamefacedness and sobriety. They should not wear costly array, pearls and gold. And further it's mentioned in the first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 to 6, that the woman that prayeth with the head uncovered, her head should be shaved off. There is no verse in the Quran and the Hadith which says that the woman who does not cover her head should be shaved off. But the Bible is stricter. Bible is stricter than the Quran. That if the woman that prays does not cover the head, the head should be shaved off. The same thing in the Hindu scripture. If you read the Hindu scriptures, it's mentioned in Ramayan that when Pasuram, when he comes to Ram, he says to his wife Sita that he the elder, therefore lower your gaze and guard your modesty. It's further mentioned if you read Rig Ved, book number 10, chapter number 85, verse number 30. It says that the woman who wears the clothes of that of a man, she is defiling it. She should not wear the clothes of a man. Further, it's mentioned that in Rig Ved, book number 8, that Brahma has ordered that the woman should cover her head. So in Hindu scriptures, Christian scriptures, Muslim scriptures, modesty is there, covering the head is there. By the passage of time, I do agree with you that Christianity now, you only see the nuns covering the head. They are called pious. If Muslim women cover their hair, they are called as subjugated. Why? Double standards. If you see a nun covered properly, therefore you see the photograph of Mother Mary. Have you seen the photograph of Mother Mary? Like a Muslima. And she was a Muslima. Muslim woman. Properly covered, with the wrist, only face seen. What I do agree with you, if you stick to the six criteria, by fashion, the types of hijab, the burqa, abaya has changed. As long as you follow the six principles of Islam and you change the color from black to blue to brown, no problem. 
As long as you don't break any of the six criteria, therefore you see new, new styles of hijab. But some styles of burqa, they are so fashionable that they break the law of Islam. There are so many shiny sequences coming that they are attracting the opposite sex. So that is haram. But otherwise, you want to wear red, you want to wear black color, no problem. People think black is compulsory. Black is not compulsory. If you wear black, maybe you may have to wash the burqa once in a week. If you wear white, you may have to wash every day. The choice is yours. You wear white and wash it every day. You wear black and wash it once a week. Choice is yours. As long as it doesn't break any of the criteria, six criteria of hijab. So now there are new types of hijab coming. As long as it doesn't break, you're allowed. But it should be modest. If it's modest, it's accepted. Second question. That you see in Ramadan that people fast. When they fast in the day, in the evening they feast. And I would like to thank you for asking this question. So why do we fast? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you so that you may learn self-restraint. You may learn taqwa. And today, scientists tell us, if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. So if you can fast, you can control your other desires. But I do agree with you, if not all, many Muslims, if you say most also, I would not mind agreeing with you, that they fast, and when they break the fast, they feast. So that defeats the purpose, I do agree with you. And many of them convert the day into night and night into day. They sleep the full day, and the full night they're playing cricket. In India, cricket. <laughs> so you have to lead a normal life. Like a normal life, you have to do more ibadah, you have to worship God more. So normally when you fast, but natural, your meals are reduced. It is medically beneficial. But if you overeat, then there will be a problem. But if you do it the correct way, there are various medical benefits of fasting, which you can refer to my video cassette. And I've given 64 episodes on fasting, which come during Ramadan. And inshallah, you can watch the various benefits of fasting. Hope that answers the question. Sister Side, if you have a question from a non-Muslim sister, could you please state it? Assalamu alaikum. This is on behalf of a non-Muslim, Sister Vandana. She says, I'm new to this concept, I have limited knowledge, therefore asking a basic question. If out of 6,000 verses, 1,000 are about scientific facts, then what really is the essence of the Quran? This is a very good question that if the Quran contains more than 6,000 verses and more than 1,000 speak about science, what is the essence of the Quran? Sister, as I mentioned in my earlier answer, the basic essence of the Quran is Tawheed. Believing in one God and worshipping Him alone and no one else. And the Quran, as I mentioned, is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. It's a book of ayats. The Quran is a book which shows you how a life should be led. And when I had a debate with Shishi Ravi Shankar, I said this is the best book on art of living. If there is any book on art of living which is the best, it is the Quran. Best book on art of living. And it has a membership of more than 1.3 billion people. So this book shows you how to lead a life. Now, many a time you understand that because the Quran is the word of Almighty God, one verse of the Quran has got multiple angles. Now, the same thousand verses which are speaking about science, it doesn't mean it only speaks about science. It speaks about various other aspects also. That's the beauty of the Quran. When a layman sees it, he understands it. When a scientific man sees it, he sees it in a different angle. It satisfies both. So that's the beauty of the Quran. That does not mean the Quran is a book of science. Yes, but there is not a single verse of the Quran which goes against established science. Because it's a book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. So this book is a book of guidance how a life should be led. It shows a person to believe in oneness of God, how to worship Him, and how to lead the life. The pros and cons, the faraiz, what a human being should do, and the prohibited things that you should abstain from. It's mentioned in the Quran. Hope that answers the question, sister.
Sister, if you have another question, go ahead, if it's from a non-Muslim. Your presentation is an impressive, but could you just ask this group to raise their hands? Who knew some of the information that you mentioned now? The thought here is, why is general education and the learning of the Holy Quran not integrated? Sister has a question that's from the audience. How many of you knew the major portion of what I've said in the lecture? Please raise your hand. Major portion of what I've mentioned, mashallah, you can say most of them. At least more than 50%, if not all. And the reason is that I've written a book also, Quran and Modern Science, compatible and compatible, which has been distributed in the conference. If those who have not got a copy, inshallah, on your way out, the copy of my talk, Quran and Modern Science, will be distributed, inshallah. It's a four color book. Regarding the part of the question, the second part, that why isn't education being given to the Muslims? So I expected the sister would have thought that maybe 1% or 10%, less than 10% raised the hand. So here you see, mashallah, majority knew it. And yet they came for the talk, alhamdulillah. Maybe they came for the question answer session. That is the best part of the program. Sister, as far as Islam is concerned, the first guidance given by Almighty God in the glorious Quran, in the last and final revelation of the human beings, it was not to offer salah. It was not to perform hajj or pilgrimage. It was ikra, read, recite, proclaim. So the first guidance given by Almighty God in the last and final revelation, it was to read, it was education. And that's the reason the major stress that the Muslims should put is on education. And Alhamdulillah, the people of the South, I know from Kerala and even of Madras, Mashallah, of Chennai. As far as the percentage is concerned in the other parts of India, Alhamdulillah, the Muslims in Kerala are 100% educated. Not Muslims, all Keralites, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, they're educated. So even culture counts into it. As far as the religion of Islam is concerned, every Muslim, he should be educated. So that's the message for those who are not educated, that acquiring education is important. And that is the first guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran. Hope that answers the question. If the sister could please stay at the microphone, I'll come back to you after I take a question from the gentleman's side. If you have more questions from non-Muslims. If there's another sister who has a question, non-Muslim, then please allow her to come to the mic and ask her question as well. But until then, I'll go with the brother in the front. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, it was amazing to see how much uh, science that the glorious Quran contained after your talk. But in most of the examples from the Quran which you gave, it is very difficult to comprehend what the Quran tells before actually the science discovers or invents that particular phenomenon. For example, you said, in the honey, there is healing of humanity in the Quran. And you mentioned it as it's about if a person is maybe say poisoned with a plant, the honey of the plant should be taken. So. What is the use, say, of a almighty holy scripture talking about things which you are only able to comprehend after the real invention is made by science? So can you tell me now something from the Quran which will be invented by science later or yet to be invented? Brother, that's a very good question that I've mentioned many things about science indirectly saying all this was already discovered earlier. And if Quran says something and after science has discovered, so what's the use? Can you tell me something which science hasn't discovered? Brother, that's the reason the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. Why? Because they read the Quran. The Quran has a lot of information on astronomy. So when they read the Quran, they try and do more investigation. They do more research. And that's how they come to know. Quran is a telegraphic message. See, the book of science, only on one subject. In medicine, one subject only requires volumes. So if that way the Quran is, this Quran, most of the human beings, they don't like to read. Oh, such a big book. So if God Almighty wrote in detail, then even a big building, they will require thousands of buildings to contain the message of the Quran. Quran is telegraphic message. So in telegraphic message, many of the Muslims, they read the Quran and they made advances in science. That's the reason we find, if you go back into history, the Muslims advanced in science and technology. But you pose the question, forget about the past. What about today? 
All what I've mentioned has been discovered earlier, but many of them were discovered by Muslims, some by non-Muslims, some by Europeans. What about things which science hasn't discovered? Fine. First, I'll tell you those things which science hasn't established, but yet there are high chances, which Quran has testified, and I believe in it. For example, Quran says in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 29, that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created the creatures in the heavens and the earth and has placed creatures in them. So Quran says there is life beside this earth. Today science hasn't proved there is life beside this earth. Scientists say there are high possibilities that life will be there beside this earth. So they are sending rockets, spaceships, moon, Mars. Quran says there is life beside this earth. I believe in it. Science may discover it tomorrow. After five years, after 10 years, after 100 years, Quran says, I believe in it. Today, there are many hypotheses. How the world will end. It says that the sun will become big and the world will end. The mountains will fall down. The mountains will become smooth. The ocean will swell up. The world will enter into a black hole. Many hypotheses. Many of these hypotheses, not all, they match with the Quran. Quran says in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 8 and 9, that the sun and the moon, they will join together. The sun will be buried in darkness. If you read Surah Takhvir, chapter number 81, verse number 1, 2 and 3, it says that the stars will fall down and lose their luster. The mountain will fall down to utter ruin. The ocean will swell up. It's mentioned in Surah Infitar, chapter number 82, verse number 1 and 2 and 3, again the ocean will swell up. The stars will fall down. Similar to many of the hypotheses. But Quran says, I believe in it. Quran further says, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 104, we have created this creation, we will destroy it and create a new creation. Science hasn't discovered that yet. Quran speaks about life after death. Science hasn't proved that yet. Quran speaks about heaven and hell. Science hasn't proved about that. Quran speaks about jinn. Today, psychologists say, extraterrestrial power. There are some people who get possessed with jinns. Quran speaks about that. Quran speaks the first man on the earth was Adam, peace be upon him. Science has improved. There are high possibilities science will prove. Now you may ask me that brother Zakir, you gave such a good talk on science and technology with 100% solid proof. You believe in life after death? You believe in jinn? You believe in heaven and hell? You a doctor? Isn't this unscientific? I said, no, brother. I believe that it is scientific. Suppose whatever the Quran has mentioned, 80% has proved to be 100% correct. I spoke about astronomy, about geology, water cycle, oceanography, botany, biology, zoology. So just hypothetically, 80% what the Quran has mentioned, suppose, has been proved to be 100% correct. The remaining 20% is ambiguous. Neither right, neither wrong. Not even 0.1% of that 20% which is ambiguous has been proved to be wrong. There is not a single verse of the Quran which can be proved false by established science. Hypothesis. So my logic says when 80% is 100% correct and the remaining 20% is ambiguous, but not even 0.1% of that 20% is proved wrong. So my logic says that even that 20% inshallah will be correct. If not today, tomorrow, after 50 years, after 100 years, after 1000 years, Allah Alam, God knows, they will prove there is life after death. They will prove there is jinn. They will prove there is hell. There is proof there is heaven, and so on and so forth. I can give another lecture on things which science hasn't proved, but inshallah will prove. Hope that answers the question. Thank you for the question. Sister Side. if you have another question from a non-Muslim sister, could you please state it? Uh, this is the last question from Sister Vandana. Your memory and grasping is phenomenal. Is there any mention about better memory power? Sister has the question that my memory is phenomenal through the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is there any verse in the Quran which speaks about memory? As far as people keep on asking me that what is the secret? Do you have a computer chip? What is the secret? The secret, it is given in the Quran. And in my Dawah training program, which I take for my students, 
I say there are three things required. Number one, the Quran says in Surah Imran, chapter number three, verse number 160, that if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put the trust in Allah. Number one is trust in Allah. Number two, the Quran says in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 69, if you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you struggle and do jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up your pathways. Number two is hard work. And number three is, Allah says in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number seven, and Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 43, first alu ahali zikri in kumdula ta'lamun. If you don't know, ask the person who's knowledgeable. The third is the technique. The technique which we train in our Dawa training program. People ask me, Brother Zakir, what is the technique? I tell you that the third and the least important. Number one is faith in Allah. With all your techniques in the world. You know, many of my students have done MBA and memorizing technique, triangle and horse. I don't know whether you know about the triangle technique and this and that and pegging. Initially, they are good students. Towards the end, they come at the bottom. Allah's help is the best, better than any pegging or any triangle, anything, number one. How do you get Allah's help? If you strive in His way. You strive in His way, you have to get success. If you don't get success, you are not striving correctly in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding technique of memory, etc., that is least important. We have a training course where we have a 40 days training course where we train people and mashallah you'll be shocked that even my students, alhamdulillah, they quote chapter number, verse number, chapter number, verse number. We have our training program where we get students from different parts of the world and we train them in how to give lectures, how to handle question answer session. It's training and hard work also. As far as the verse of the Quran is concerned, before the beginning of my talk, I always quote a verse of the Quran from Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25 and 28, which says, Rabbi Shuhali Sadri. This was a dua when Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tells to Moses that go and deliver the message. And before delivering the message, Moses, who was a stutterer, he used to stammer. And those who know me personally, even I was a stammerer when I was a child. And in my dream, a person can dream of anything in the world. In my dream, I could have dreamt of becoming the best surgeon in the world. But I couldn't have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. Because I was a stammerer. People ask me, what is your name? I said, my name is Adha, 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 That was me. Now, coming in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe about 10, 15 years back when I got in the field of Dawa, when I started doing Dawa, stammering wasn't there. When I spoke with Christian missionaries, stammering used to vanish. I never thought of becoming a speaker. I came on the stage because my colleague was cold feet. I came, it clicked, and now I'm on the stage. And now by Allah's grace, I give lectures to tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. The largest gathering is a million people live, alhamdulillah. That comes back to the verse of the Quran. When Moses was asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver the message to Pharaoh and his people, he read a dua. A dua, a prayer, from Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25 to 28, which says, Rabbi Shrahali Sadri, O my Lord, expand my breast for me, expand my center for me. Rabbi Shrahali Sadri, Vayasilli Amri, and make my task easy for me. Rabbi Shrahali Sadri, Vayasilli Amri, Wahalul Ugdata Millesan Yafkav Kauli, and remove the impediment from my speech. Because Musa alayhi salam was a stammerer, I also was a stammerer. Remove the impediment from my speech so that they will understand me. So the people to whom I'm delivering the message, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to expand my breath for me, to make my task easy for me, remove the impediment from my speech so that the people will understand me. So this is a dua which can also be used for memory. But the main is having faith in Allah, second is striving hard, and third is technique. Hope that answers the question. That will be the last question for the evening. And with that, we would like to end this, the second night of the 10-day international conference and exhibition brought to you by Peace, Vision of Islam for Harmony, Awareness, 
and education. Jazakallah khair for your attendance.